We're continuing in our series entitled, Written with the Finger of God. We've been dealing with the law of God in covenantal context. We've looked at the definition and the purpose of biblical law. And we're seeing it in light of the teaching of the Westminster Divines. As they wrote it in their confession and the larger catechism. We're looking at sermon, I believe it is 45. Or 44, I don't know, I'm lost somewhere in this thing. We're still dealing with the first commandment. And we're talking about the negative side of the law of God. What are the sins forbidden in the first commandment? Now our text for this series is Deuteronomy 9, 10 through 11. Here Moses writes, Then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of forty days and forty nights that the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. Shall we look to the Lord our God in prayer? Our Holy Father, we thank you for the privilege again to come back and to consider the things that are forbidden in thy holy commandment. We thank you, O God. You have not left us in darkness, but you have given us light and how that we should honor you each and every day of our life. And we ask, O God, for your grace and strength to do what is commanded of us and to not do what is also commanded of us. We ask, O oh God, especially to give us grace that we would be able to honor you, to glorify you in each and every aspect of our life by keeping your holy commands and that we seek to apply them daily so that we would be a people of thy book, people who honor you. We ask, O oh Holy God, you would bless us now in this time, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. We are <clears throat> again returning to the first commandment, which I already noted. We're dealing with this, the moral law of God that binds us. And we're dealing with this question in 105. What are the sins forbidden in the first commandment? It has a lengthy answer to the question, and I will read it to you. The sins forbidden in the first commandment are atheism, in denying or not having a God. We've talked about that extensively. Atheism is forbidden. Secondly, idolatry in having or worshiping more gods than one or any with or instead of the true God. The not having and avouching him for God and our God. The omission or the neglect of anything due unto him, that is due unto God, required in this commandment. Ignorance, forgetfulness, misapprehensions, false opinions, unworthy and wicked thoughts of him, and bold and curious searchings into his secrets, all profaneness, hatred of God, self-love, self-seeking, and all other inordinate and immoderate settings of our mind, will or affection upon other things and taking them off from him in whole or in part that is not giving to God the full totality of all the honor and praise that is due unto him but removing from him those parts that are required of us and so we say in some ways we honor God but then in some ways we have withdrawn some of our honor of those things that we are to put our mind and our will and our affections upon him and him alone. 
Vain credulity, unbelief, heresy, misbelief, distrust, despair, incorrigibleness, and insensibleness under judgments, hardness of heart, pride, presumption, carnal security, tempting of God, using unlawful means and trusting in lawful means, carnal delights and joys, corrupt, blind, and indiscreet zeal, lukewarmness and deadness in the things of God, estranging ourselves and apostatizing from God, praying or giving any religious worship to saints, angels, or any other creature, all compacts and consulting with the devil and hearkening to his suggestions, making men the lords of our faith and conscience, slighting and despising God and his commands, resisting and grieving of his spirit, discontent, impatience at his dispensations, charging him foolishly for the evils he inflicts on us, and ascribing the praise of any good we either are, have, or can do to fortune, idols, ourselves, or any other creature." Unquote. Shall we consider what the next thing the divines have directed our attention to? And that is the sin of misbelief, as the divines have here expressed. The term misbelief means a religious delusion that is a firm or confident faith in something which is false or wrong. Paul thought, if you will, think about this, that he was doing the will of God in persecuting God's people. But in reality, he wasn't doing that at all. We often are involved in misbelief, and so many in the church today are involved in this problem. They believe they're doing the will of God. They believe that they are following what God wants them to follow. But in reality, they are not doing what God really has told them to do according to his word. This misbelief is something that we need to consider just as the Apostle Paul, when he thought it was the right and religious thing to do to persecute the Christians. Acts 26, 9 here expresses this. Paul says, indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Misbelief, misdoing the will of God as it relates to our life is very important for us to consider. And it is important for the very reason that we must not be deluded that what we have put our faith in is that which is right when in reality it is false, it is wrong. It sounds pious, but it is not the truth of God. And that itself is the problem. We think we're doing that which is religious, but the problem is it may be religious, but it is not according to the scripture. Our religious beliefs and practices are not based upon our feelings, our desires, but simply upon doing what God says in his word. Nothing else matters. When someone says to me, well, I know that I'm doing the will of God, my question is, how do you know? Well, I get some kind of a good feeling about myself. So do I. When I'm at a football game and I'm, my team's winning, I feel real good. How does that differ from yours? Feeling good has nothing to do with it. Well, I am satisfied I'm doing the will of God, and I don't regret it at all. Well, neither do I. Nor neither does the guy who robs a bank. He thinks... I'm happy, I've got the money, and they haven't caught me yet. 
It is not a standard of what you feel. It is not a standard of what you think. It is not some kind of misdirected belief that God has called us to do something he has not called us to do. That's the basis of a lot of today's legalism in Christianity. People think they're doing the will of God, when in reality, they're not doing it at all. We must not give in to such delusions of religion. We are called to follow the scripture at every point and every turn in our life. It is not asking the question, what would Jesus do? The only thing he would do is the word of God. He's not going to sit around and you never even see him do those kind of things. Twelve disciples come up to him and say, what do we do next, Lord? I don't know. Let me think about it for a while. He didn't do that kind of thing. He was about to do the will of his father. Where do you find that will? Where do you have the mind of Christ expressed to us? Constantly, if you look at his life when he's teaching, he always says, Doth not the scripture truth, hath not the prophet said? Have we not been commanded to? It's always been on the revelation of the special word God has given to us, how we are to govern our lives and our minds and everything that we seek to do. It is important, therefore, to always remember it's not enough to delude ourselves with the idea we are doing the will of God when there is no basis for doing it. You must have a sound theological basis that has been developed from the word of God. It is the word that commands. It is the word that binds us. It is the word that will judge us in everything we seek to do. So we must seek to do only what God has commanded at all times. I don't care what our desire is. I don't care what good men have said. It's not enough. Only what God commanded are we required to do. And we must have solid exegetical thinking we must have, not just pick and choose verses out, we must be able to fit it within the framework of the totality of the system God has taught in his word to us. So no matter what you think, you could think all kinds of things, and they can be nice things, they can be pleasant things, they can be helpful things, they can be all kinds of things. That doesn't mean you're doing the will of God. Do not be deluded by your personal feelings, emotions, or anything else. Because all of those things are only expressions of what we're thinking. And they shouldn't be an expression. If you love someone, you show them by saying, not only do I love you, but you express that. If it's a husband to a wife, he loves her. He's intimate with her. He kisses her. He tells her, I love you. I'll do everything I can do for you. But he's not driven by his emotion. It's never how God intended for us to live. We walk by the word and everything that we do. But especially in our religion, we walk by the word. We always walk according to what he says to us. The divines then go on to speak of distrust and despair. It is important to note that these two terms are related to each other. The two terms mean a total distrust concerning God and his word. The term distrust means doubting or disbelieving God's promises, love, and goodness. To us. Psalm 70, 22, because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. 
trusting God. We must never distrust God. We must not doubt. We can never be in a state of disbelief concerning what he has said to us, but rather we are to embrace it and we are to adhere to it. The term despair means disbelieving, that is, the promises of God, the love of God, the goodness of God in its totality to us. We always must realize God is constantly loving and caring for us. Despair should be driven from our lives. How many times do we fall into those states of gloom and doom? We lose that state of contentment because we feel really bad about something somebody said or something they didn't say to us or something they should have done that they didn't do, but they themselves, we never consider their circumstance. It's very self-centered when you have despair and you think, wow, I don't think anybody likes me anymore. Nobody ever called me. Nobody talks to me. I don't get the attention that I need. God gives you all of that attention. He's never, he's never walks from you. He's always with you. But for some reason, we think we need man. But man cannot fulfill what God only can fulfill. True, <clears throat> the true means of believing the promises and considering the love and the goodness of God to us is an understanding the God that we serve. We cannot distrust, we cannot be in despair in the life that we live. Genesis 4, 13 says, And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I <coughs> excuse me, can bear. Cain gave way to despair because he said that his punishment was greater than that which he could bear. He didn't turn to God. He didn't ask God to forgive the sin of murdering his brother. He didn't put his hope and his trust in the things that God promised. All the way back then, there were many promises already given. Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelium. That there is redemption and salvation with God. That God would deliver us from our state of rebellion. Judas also gave way to despair. Same kind of despair. Instead of praying to God for forgiveness, he went and he hanged himself. And is that not one of the great problems of despair? It's one of the great problems we have when we get into those states in which we have such despair over the way our life is going. And we become depressed. And the depression gives way to distrust. I no longer believe what God has said, but I am stuck in this state of disbelief. Life has lost its meaning and its purpose. Despair is a common motive for suicide. When a person has come to think that there's no hope, but in reality he's forgotten about the hope of God, the hope that he may, in his desperate state of unbelief, turn unto God and seek to have the help of God rather than end all of his life. But that's the ultimate direction of despair when we don't trust in God. When we don't have a proper moding to, to do what God has commanded us to do. When we don't live in the total love of God. When for some reason that is absent in our life, it is a sin. We are not trusting God at that time. The divines also talked about using the word incorrigibleness. 
The word literally means being incapable of being corrected. Jeremiah 5.3 O Lord, are not your eyes on the truth? You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. You have consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to return. Both God's goodness and his judgments ought to bring man to a point in which he is willing to turn in repentance. But unless it is accompanied by the special work of the Holy Spirit, those individuals cannot turn in repentance to God. And yet, that's not, is it not what the word itself really is signifying to us? The idea of incorrigibleness is this state that we cannot escape out of our sinfulness, but we are stuck with it. There are many people who, in times of welfare and prosperity, simply ignore or forget God. They've done well. They don't have needs any longer. <clears throat> it's easy to live in those time periods. But when calamity or trouble comes, <coughs> they become stubborn. <coughs> and defy God in their persistence of unbelief. That is the state of incorrigibleness. They will not turn. They will never turn to God and say, help me when they know that God is the only help in this life <coughs> that can really help them, excuse me. <coughs> but that is the state of incorrigibleness. The divine, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the divine speak of being insensibleness, of the insensibleness under judgment. This is when a person fails to recognize God's judgment in times of troubles and calamities that bind him time of realizing, even as a nation, when we are in trouble. <coughs> and we are under the judgment of God. Isaiah 42, 25 says, Therefore he has poured upon them the fury, his fury, of his anger and the strength of battle. It has set him on fire all around, yet he did not know and it burned him, yet he did not take it to heart. Who, those who attribute all of their troubles to fate, to chance, or bad luck, or to the mere operation of natural laws, never see God's hand in what is happening to them. We must see the hand of God in the providential governance of our life. We must understand, if all things work together, according to Romans 8, if all things work together for our good, then every judgment, every trial, every tribulation of our life has a purpose. And we must ask the question, what is God teaching us? It's not always, why is God punishing us? But sometimes it is God using a certain means to bring to pass a lesson that we need to learn in our life. We must be careful that we do not fail to realize that God has decreed all that comes to pass. And that no matter what comes to pass, 
and all things that are under God's providential government, and all the things that work together for God's moral government of the world. The very purpose of this life, of every individual, of the nation itself, before God. It is God who is either correcting or who is judging in this life. Everything in your life, think about it. Nothing comes to pass that is not the judgment of God upon you. God teaching, training you to correct you in order that you live a life that he wants you to live. We need to be a people to have a right state of mind. That everything God does, he does it to impress upon us. The life that we're living and how that we are to live it even more so to his glory. That's why we're not to get excited. We're not to get angry. We're not to turn and pretend that somehow we can fix our own problems. The skills and ability that anyone has in working through the things of life that they have to deal with is simply the grace of God enabling them to use the gifts that he has given. Always, our trust is in the Lord, but we also want to know, what is he teaching me? What is it that I'm not hearing? Why am I not listening to God? Got to ask that question. I have, and you'll have to do it too. There are many things we've done in this life that we say, why would I have done that? And yet God teaches us. You cannot sin. You cannot have distrust or despair. You cannot have misbelief in your life and think you will escape my judgment. It always comes. It doesn't always come immediately. Sometimes he just gives you a new rope. He put an extra 10 foot on it. And you run a little further each time and then hang yourself. We're good at doing that. And then we complain. I got hung with the new rope with 10 more feet than what I thought I had on there. Why? Why aren't we examining our life? Why aren't we trying to say, what, oh God, are you trying to teach me? Because all that he's trying to teach his children is to be good sons and daughters, to obey, to hear his voice in all that is being done to his glory. We must be careful that we do not become totally blind to what God has willed for us. We need to hear his voice and everything that affects the life that we live. We are to be careful not to become so enamored with the life that we live and our stubbornness and our sinfulness that we will not hear the voice of God when he seeks to correct us and direct us in the life that we live. I encourage you to think about these things that we've been talking about. There's still a lot more to go through. But are these not the things that our basic life are made up of? We're not to believe delusions concerning religion. We're to live by the book. We're not to distrust God and his promises. We're not to despair and believe that God is not truly loving and giving everything that we need in this life. Because he's promised to do those things through his spirit in the redemption he's given us. We are to be careful that we do not become incorrigible, that we cannot be turned when we are convicted by the spirit who indwells us. If we truly are Christians, we must be careful that we do not become blind to the truth of God and see his governing hand in our lives. All things 
truly do work for the glory of God. So you have to ask yourself a question. How is God affecting me every day? Every day. When from the time you wake up until you wake up again the next day. How has God affected my life? What is he doing to make me more his child, more conformed to his word, and all that he has commanded of me to do as a Christian? Those are the things that we have to ask ourselves. Because these are things that are things that truly this first command is really trying to get through us. If we cannot live our life this way, we will not honor God. The very first commandment of honoring him means that we must set aside the things of our life, the cares of our life. We must be totally enamored with our God and remember who it is that controls every aspect of it and line ourselves up with his revelation, putting our hope and our trust on what he has said not despairing, but seeking the establishment of his love in our life. To always be ready to repent when we're wrong. And always willing to have our eyes open to ask the question, God, what do you want me to learn from these circumstances of life? That's what the devotees wanted you to understand about this commandment. These are the sins forbidden. When you don't do these things, and you fall into that state in which you are now walking outside the will of God, and you do not acknowledge God as the God that he is, that's the problem we have within our life. There's much that we have to do in this first commandment. What sins are forbidden? That's why there's so many things enumerated here. Because these are the things of our life. These are the things that happen daily. These are the things that keep us from honoring and worshiping the one true and living God. I encourage you to take them to heart. In everything that you seek to do, seek to live to the glory of God, to honor him in your life. Shall we pray?